to 18 years the first time I'm, she's married to a classmate of mine from engineering and who also I, is a genius who's also a poet so you can imagine the combination the his name is Vijay Nambisan so I was introduced at the uh, ba, uh, the Chennai station and I took a Brindavan at 6 o'clock in the morning from Chennai to Bangalore three hours and she was with me and that three hours she would have told me about seven stories. First time I'm meeting her, seven stories non-stop, keeping me completely scintillating and it was so scintillating and I was completely alive at the end of it all. So <laughs> that was the first introduction. After that, every time she meets us, it's uh, such a beautiful and uh, lovely experience. Um, who would ever think that somebody from a uh, gold medalist from St. John's Medical uh, would at any point of time, if you ask a gold medalist from any college today and say, would you ever be uh, sitting in a, uh, in a in Lonavla and serving the poor and teaching 40 kids practically every day of your life and dedicating your life to migrant labor and teaching them, writing books after having done an FRCS from London, I think it's quite an unbelievable story and an unbelievable journey. This... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, well, here she's going to tell you about the uh, story that must not be told, and I won't take more, much more time of yours. I'll leave the stage to Kaveri to do her book reading. Thanks very much. Is that all I have to do? I don't have to switch on anything? No. <laughs> the mic is not facing up. This has to go up. Thank you, Manthan, for making this event possible and thank you, audience, for taking the risk of listening to a relatively unknown speaker. I'm a surgeon and a novelist. I live in two worlds. The first is that of precise anatomical knowledge, diagnosis and practical skills learned formally in medical schools and hospitals. It is mentally demanding, physically exhausting, and often stressful. It is teamwork. The second, the world of writing, is one of lived experience, observation, and imagination, which I must turn into meaningful sentences that others may read and appreciate. Here I would like to digress for a little while to tell you about my own journey, first into medicine and then towards writing and doing the two together, since it seems to surprise a lot of people. And it was Ajay Gandhi who really asked me to do this, to explain this. 
when I decided to do medicine, it was um, at a time when um, we had to face, as young people, what's called the family will. I don't mean the will as per inheritance will, but I mean this will, you know. So the family has a will which either gently pushes you in a direction they want you to go, or they push you with force. And um, so my family was not very much in favor of my doing medicine, because girls didn't need to work, you know, or do such difficult work. But anyway, I stayed stubborn and I went to medical college. And I fed well. And um, when it came to what I would do after that, I decided I wanted to be a surgeon. And of course, the family was appalled. Um, and uh, I remember my father taking me to the professor of surgery. Uh, who, and the professor had been told to advise me why I should not be doing surgery. And uh, he said uh, I was not fit to be a surgeon because I was too frail. And uh, anyway, I went on to do it. Um, I went to England and did my fellowship with the Royal College of Surgeons. And um, I was all set to come back. That I had al always known. And um, at that time, uh, my medical college wanted me to join their uh, department of surgery. But um, strangely, I got a letter from a friend who was at a Catholic mission hospital in Bihar, in a very small town, um, a town where cycle rickshaw is the mode of um, travel. So um, she said that we have a very nice hospital, but we don't have a surgeon. Our surgeon has left. So would you be willing to help? So I went there. So um, that was my first um, surgical experience after I came back to India. and I. I like to believe that my training in England was my basic surgical training and the training in Bihar was the speciality training because it really uh, taught me much more than any medical college or any uh, bigger center could have taught me. It was a little uh, decoyed infested town with a very high crime rate and along with the um, daily, I mean the usual list of operations, we had to do gunshot wounds and stab wounds and bomb blast injuries. These were routines. Um, and the, the, the scope of um, work and the type of experience gained there, I think it helped me right through. And I've been back in Bihar again for another stint in the same hospital and it was um, just as tumultuous, I can say. Um, and since then, I've worked in various rural areas and small towns in Uttar Pradesh, in um, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. And all have been very different and um, very rewarding. I started to write after, well after I became a surgeon. And um, really, the journey, it's um, I have to admit that I started writing not out of any um, very, uh, you know, great ideas. I started to write because I wanted to see my name in print. I thought it would be one. <laughs> so, so I wrote, you know, little pieces. I, I wrote for children. I did a lot of um, very, very um, simple sort of writing. I wrote for women's magazines. Very soon realized I was writing the um, sort of what you call it. I was fashioning my writing to suit the reader, so to speak, and it wasn't satisfying me. But writing for children was very, very, uh, very, very, very <coughs> fortunate because children, we don't, you cannot deceive children with your writing. And uh, you learn to, you know, speak um, with a true voice. So writing for children was really a very good experience for me. And then I started to write for adults. Uh, and I started writing, of course, fiction. I do write non-fiction, but not very much. I write on healthcare issues and some sometimes literary issues. Um, <coughs> surgeons and writers will have to take risks. I have found this. I, I can't say I knew this when I started off. I'm glad I didn't know any of this. 
but I have reflected upon it. And I do see that surgeons and writers will have to take risks. In fact, every creative activity is defined by the ability to take risks and also to know when to avoid them. In surgery, this is very straightforward. Um, if you get a patient who is bleeding very seriously, uh, maybe internally, you have the choice of sending him or her away to another hospital, maybe 50 or 100 kilometers away, uh, where there may be better facilities, or at least you can wash your hands off a critical case, or you can operate on the patient and try to save them. And if you feel that you have the competence, if you feel you have the experience, then I think you should go ahead. So that is, of course, a risk, because if something was to go wrong, people would, of course, be. But the other side is that the person may not reach another hospital. So a surgeon, always, a surgeon has to constantly take such risks. I'm just giving one example, but a surgeon always has to take such risks. Life does not afford us the second luxury of knowing how to avoid taking risks or how to avoid doing the wrong thing at times. And I have burned my hands often. For me, surgery came before writing, as I said. My surgeon friends were amused when I started to write. Writing was well all right, but stories they thought I was being frivolous. <coughs> the benefits of surgery are easy to see, but how about writing, especially writing fiction? What are the benefits? Why do we write fiction? Is the writing of stories <coughs> frivolous? Does it have any value other than that of entertainment or time pass? And if it is frivolous, then how about painting, music, or any other form of art? The first allure of any form of art, be it a kirtan, a ghazal, a painting, or a story, is aesthetic. As a novelist, my primary concern is to tell a good story for sheer enjoyment, much like making, the, much like the making of a good film or a beautiful clay pot. But not every good story is a great one. And even a great story can begin to fade. With time, its appeal might not be as big as it once was. But almost always, a very good story will survive. We need not go further than the Mahabharata or Ramayana, the works of Shakespeare or the Bible, to understand this. Literature happens when language is used to convey thought, emotion, and news in a way that touches us deeply, perhaps disturbingly. It awakens our sensitivity, which enables us to understand people who may not be like ourselves. It is something like looking into the dark interior of our own minds with a searchlight. Read Brother Scaramazov to see the agonizing result of jealousy and hatred within a family, or the compelling comic masterpiece that Catch-22, which depicts the futility of wars. Joseph Heller does it better than most others, who have written about wars. And we have our epics, which draws into family drama, full-blown battles, and inner conflict between good and evil, which we all know and experience in our own hearts. Such works of art make us more aware of other people and kindle our understanding. That is perhaps why we return over and over again to a favorite poet, or reread novels, or treasure other forms of when I talk of the uh, epics, particularly, I'd like to just uh, draw, uh, I mean, take an example about how we can interpret why fiction is so allure, I mean, you know, so appealing, or why people read fiction, good fiction, uh, because there are so many ways of interpreting good fiction. And uh, like our own epics, if I may call it fiction, but if you take characters like, um, say, Surpanaka in, um, in the Ramayana, who is, uh, who happens to lust after Rama, to lust for Rama, who is already a married man, and she is uh, punished with mutilation. Now, I know it is wrong to lust after a married man, but does it merit mutilation? 
you know, so these these are questions we can ask within you know we can we can think about or uh, Wali and Sugriva uh, when Rama meets Sugriva and Sugriva requests him to help him defeat Wali. Uh, Rama goes behind, I mean, he hides behind seven trees, and while Sugriva and Wali are fighting, he shoots his arrow from behind Wali. He shoots him in the back. Now, was that noble? Uh, and yet, Surpanaka and Wali form, fall on the wrong side of Dharma. So, every story is open to interpretations. They have different, we, we can have different perspectives, and that is probably the, the reason why epics and great stories appeal to us. I have a very good friend, a young, brilliant scientist, whom I value particularly because of his thought-provoking arguments. Last year, when we met, he wanted to know why people write poetry and why others read them. It is, after all, prose cut, into, cut up into lines. Some vague and romantic notion of an experience, he said. I just can't see any point in it. <coughs> he felt the same about what he called modern art. My husband, who's a poet, and I were sort of horrified by this and offered him a few poems to read, really good ones. But he was adamant. A waste of time reading such stuff, he said. He simply couldn't get off the subject for the rest of the afternoon. My young friend may not need poetry, or art for that matter. He will be a brilliant scientist and engineer in spite of his rejection of art. He will most probably remain the lovely person he is. But poetry and art do not need him to survive. They will not only survive, but change the lives of many people who take the trouble to understand and enjoy the aesthetics of words. When I started to write and publish, another friend told me rather pointedly, I don't like these arty types. They're pretentious and bogus. Most of them, she said, were bad citizens with loose morals. She said this many years ago, and even now, she clings to this belief. I think she felt that I would be less effective as a surgeon if I took to things like writing stories. <coughs> Some weeks back, I attended a reading by, a, by the novelist Raj Rao in Pune. He writes quite fearlessly about the gay community. His new novel, Hostel Number 131, is both truthful and explicit. It is also very moving. He told me later that one of his uncles had called him up and said he was embarrassed by the book and afraid that his two teenage <laughs> children might get hold of it. And some gay activists criticized him for talking about gays with irreverent humor. The truth about telling the truth is you just cannot predict who will be annoyed, who will stop talking to you, or who will burn your books or send assassination threats. As for Raj Rao's book, I think it will survive such criticism and survive for a long time. In the end, posterity always forgives truth. Recently, I came, came upon a very interesting word, the meso musist, in Milan Kundera's collection of essays, the encounter essays. A meso musist is one who rejects literature and art at an intellectual level. Art becomes an object of hatred simply because the meso musist does not understand it and so feels humiliated by its very presence. To quote Kundera, to be without a feeling of art is no disaster. A person can live in peace without reading Prost or listening to Schubert or we can say Tyagaraja. But the Miso Muses does not live in peace. He feels humiliated by the existence of something that is beyond him and he hates it. There is the popular Miso music, the fascist and the communist regimes have made use of it. But the intellectual dissemination of art will be far more devastating than the burning of books. A rejection of art due to political and ideological reasons can turn vicious. 
misomiosis attack art, especially when it is fearless and bold, when it reveals a truth that is uncomfortable for society. They will do anything they can to suppress or destroy art because it embodies free thinking and perspicacity. In short, they fear truth. We don't need to look northward at China or anywhere else to see such intolerance. In our country, it has become fashionable to denounce art by alleging that it has upset sentiments, religious, cultural, or personal. Women writers seem to bear the brunt of such censure more acutely. They are expected to be more prudish than dealing with sex on the page. <coughs> if a woman writer strays beyond a certain barcode of decency with her words, it is more or less assumed that she is loose moral and a bad influence on others. In the 1970s, the Hindi writer Mridula Garg was summoned to court because in one of her novels, she describes the thoughts of a young woman who detests her husband's lovemaking. And this allegation was made not when the novel was published in Hindi, but 10 years later when the English translation came out. Those who protested felt that such descriptions were an insult to the institution of marriage. We hear of censure more often nowadays. A few years, a few weeks ago, Rohinton Mystery's novel, Such a Long Journey, was withdrawn from the college curriculum in Maharashtra because Bal Thackeray's grandson found passages which he felt would upset Marathi sentiment. As you know, Such a Long Journey came out, I think, 20 years back. Marathi sentiment looked after itself very well for more than two decades since the book was published and read widely. Please also note the fact that this grandson of Thackeray has just been inducted into Shiv Sena politics as the leader of the youth wing. Perhaps rapid material progress and more knowledge has made us intolerant and stupid. Today, we want to kill off words because they annoy us. <clears throat> Why is it then that we do not want to kill off the false words and untruths spoken by politicians and, so -called, and some so-called godmen? Why is it we don't want to kill untruths depicted in advertisements? Sometimes <clears throat> the, right, the, writer, sorry, the writer carries a heavy responsibility as well. I mean, when I, not just the writer, the artist. Sometimes, not often, she fails to recognize the difference between satirical, critical, or comic, and being malicious. Neither of the two writers that have mentioned, Rohinton Mystery and Mridula Gar, have resorted to malice. When we sit down to write, we must be able to recognize malice, lest it, lest it creep into our words, because it can, like hydrogen sulfide, vitiate the atmosphere. Malice and intolerance have one feature in common, they boomerang. Is literature, indeed all of art, irrelevant? Should we instead dedicate ourselves to knowledge on one side and to entertainment on the other? Should we be satisfied with, with Sidney Sheldon's and Jeffrey Archer's Bollywood and Rajnikan? Does the world really need Kabir, Shakespeare, Tyagaraja, or Bhimsen Joshi? Does it need a Manji Bhava and does it at all need Kaveri Nambishan, the writer, especially when she chooses to write frivolous stories? Someone said about my writing, uh, Kaveri Nambishan has an awkwardness to her style. Let me read an excerpt from my novel, at least to reassure myself that this awkwardness is my one gift. <laughs> Before I read, I need to just tell you a little bit in way of uh, introduction to what I'm reading. Uh, this book has got through two threads running through it. One is that of an aging widower, Simon J. Sukumar, uh, and his wife, Harini. She was a domineering woman, and she happened to make all the decisions in the family. After her, uh, They had a happy married life, but Simon often regrets the fact that he could not make his own decisions, or he, he failed to make his own decisions, and wonders what he would have done had it been otherwise. 
and the other part of the story is that of Sitara, um, where um, which uh, Simon finds out about through his a uh, boy who runs errands for him, Velu, and through Velu he comes to know Sitara, which is actually a slum, and the, uh, the various people who live there, and his whole life sort of uh, complicated with by his uh, friendship with Velu and with Sitara. So first I'm reading about Simon and Hari. Uh, just short, short pieces. This is about their wedding night. Our real first night was spent in Harini's uncle's house. We had the privacy of a room. I changed into my pajamas and lay in bed, wishing desperately to postpone the feat expected of me. Harini emerged from the bathroom in a fresh white petticoat and a blue blouse with three quarter sleeves. I stared at her radiant waist. She sat on the bed. Have you washed your feet? I bathed in the evening as soon as we reached, I said. You should wash your feet before getting into bed. I never forgot it. That first night, when I came back to bed, having washed my feet, Harini received me by ardently biting my ear. She taught me the pleasures of love. It came naturally to her. For love, Harini had all the time in the world. It left me feeling elated and slightly debauched. In all our years of marriage, I never fully understood my wife's ardor or her compulsive need for order. Just a little later on. We were not an ill-matched couple, but it was hardly possible to run the three-legged race together. When we tried, we stumbled. We weren't wise and virtue, or black and white. I was attracted to austerity, and therefore to Harini, and felt good about foregoing my inherited wealth. Her Simon happens to be from a well-to-do background, compared to Harini. I was also infatuated by the indulgences of wealth. It, be it became my voyeuristic outlet. Was that wrong? My dreams were slowly dying within me. Their colors were melting and merging and changing into puzzling dull mixes until they seemed insubstantial. But loving Harini, being married to her, was nothing short of a miracle. I learned to treat her like a neatly tended garden around which I had to step carefully. This is one last bit about Simon. Uh, this is much later on. Um, Simon is a widower and his grown-up daughter is talking to him about the fact that she does not like to be controlled. She doesn't like too much discipline in her life. And Simon is thinking to himself, control, how well I know it. Harini was a control freak, was she not? Spend less, eat less, enjoy less. She recognized my tendency to indulge and tried to reform me, especially with regard to food. But the cherished bond between stomach and soul cannot be broken without destroying a lot else. At times, when the stomach feels like the center of one's universe, it is better to treat it as such. I help myself to food in secret so my wife would not find out. I mustered the skills of a petty thief, memorized the layout of bottles and tins on the kitchen shelf. With my eyes, I measured the level of raspberry jam in the bottle, the quantity of butter in its steel dish, the number of mutton pieces left after dinner. A spoonful here, a couple of bites there, and with my greed assuage, my mind was at peace. It gave me the spiritual strength to withstand the austerities showered on me like blessings by my wife. Mutton bread, said Harini one Sunday afternoon. Did you not brush your teeth after lunch? I forgot I bluffed and went through the motions of repeat brushing. I managed, I managed. Forbidden tidbits became an eloquent source of happiness. But a husband with a soft belly in spite of food so sarcastic and frugal, Harini began to smell my lies. I was by then an incurable creature. 
every afternoon something, late evening something else, and late at night one last mouthful of fulfillment, one last spoonful, one satisfying bite. She found me out. With my finger, the same that I dipped from ghee to sugar to ghee and back, leaving evidence on the kitchen table in the ghee pot. Harini, that good soul, was overpowering me. One day, a few months before my retirement, the idea of rebellion struck me just like that, as I went out of the door on my way to work. Walking towards the bus stop, I decided. I asked the conductor to be dropped at the end of the bus stop beyond Punamali High Road. After a glass of tea, I started to walk. Anarchy, rebellion, there was a spring in my step and a smile for every stranger. By noon, I was on a busy street with plenty of small restaurants. Here was a place that looked like it might have a toilet. I was right. Having relieved myself, I settled it upon a table and studied the much-handled curry steak menu. What? A wine list? Gin? Whiskey? Beer? Beer? Beer! Two hours later, I emerged, full of goodwill towards the world. I tipped the waiter 20 rupees for having served me chicken supreme, Kerala par paratha and beer. I tossed all the coins in my pockets into the supplicating, supplicating hands that waited outside. I sobered up on my way back home by bus. It was late enough for Harini to be back, but wonder of wonders, that day she was late. When Harini came, she did not suspect a perfect day in the life of Simon B. Jesu. <laughs> <laughs> So, can literature change society? I don't think so. What it does do is change individuals. <clears throat> literature works by touching one, two, or tens of thousands of people, each with his own unique emotional territory. Society is not an amorphous mass of humanity to be clubbed into various groups for convenience. It is made up of you and me and the man selling meat or the girl riding her moped to a call center or the convict or the lady in the brothel. And each one will be touched or untouched by literature in a different way. It is said that the role of, lit role of the fiction writer is to bring the reader news. It may be news of a world unknown to the reader or from a world already known and presented with a fresh perspective. This world must be well observed and well realized, something like Naipaul's A House for Mr. Biswas, or the historic tales of Robert Graves, or the minutely observed inner world of Shivrama Parana, tales in which we witness human dilemma and the conflict within. A friend and critic in English literature from Stafford wrote me recently that for her, good fiction is often inventive and playful. It takes the reader on a joyride of imagination, intrigue, and humor. Yes, humor is a sadly neglected but essential ingredient of good fiction. <coughs> so, so also the simplicity and elegance of language, another hallmark of good writers, Mahatma Gandhi, Thoreau, Robert Graves, and Chekhov come to my mind. In today's world, where every human value will be constantly questioned, Fiction writers need to ask ourselves more critically about our storytelling intentions. All writing, like speech, is communication. In one's eagerness to be clever and saleable, it is easy to forget this. Words can be used as a means of false communication, as we see in political speeches, in the media, and in easy jargon we resort to in conversation and just as dangerously in fiction. Sometimes neither the writer nor the reader is able to recognize the falsehood. Thus, insidiously, the channels of communication begin to decay. With modern forms of communication that we are all used to, the internet, email, Facebook, and, um, and, uh, and the mobile, uh, the, the conversation is really a dying, um, sort of 
form of art, if you'd like to call it, because it is, people find it, people are always connected, but very rarely can um, sit quietly and speak to one another face to face. It, it's coming, it's becoming less um, common, I think, and a little more complicated for people, <laughs> even when we live in a, in a, in a single home or, or in a certain um, sort of a friendly group or whatever. But conversation, probably in a, about 20 years, there will be colleges for especially for learning the art of conversation. <laughs> You're going to lose it. The surgical profession, which is a very practical one of using one's brains and one's hands, has also taught me a certain type of integrity, which I believe runs parallel to writing. A surgeon must reach for that single truth, that choice which is the best for her patient. She will make mistakes, face failure and disappointment. If her objectives are clear, sooner or later she will do it. The pain of failure and the joys of success are vital to both surgery and writing. Reality is not easy to find in a world that offers a bewildering array of choices. It is far easier to wrap ourselves in what we consider good, correct, or proper, to shudder at the atrocities we witness and carry on living our good lives. The role of fiction is to peel away the skin, to shake us out of our presumed innocence or ignorance, and to enable the writers and the readers to see through the blind spots of civilization. In, 19, in 1999, a series weekly in France published a list of 18 20th century geniuses. It had the likes of Bill Gates, Coco Chanel, and Stanley Kubrick, Lee Corbusier, but not a single poet, novelist, dramatist, or philosopher. You can cast your mind back at leisure to those hundred years and see if you find any wordsmith worthy of inclusion in this list. I am quite happy to leave the territory of geniuses alone, secure in the fact that I can think of several writers and thinkers who belong there. As for me, I write with the hope that fiction, literature, and all of art will create a friction of ideas and thought and bring us face to face with the real questions that should concern us. Let me finish with another excerpt. Uh, this is a slightly longer one. And, uh, do I have that time? To yeah, 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 absolutely. This is from uh, the characters in Sitara. Of course, they all merge into the story. But um, here I'm uh, going to read about a character called Swami, who, who is uh, not the main character, but he is important in the story. And he comes from a very uh, poor beginnings, and in his, during his childhood, he was the, he's the child of beggars. Swami learned to beg when, as an 18-month-old, he stretched out a grubby hand and closed his fingers over cold pieces of metal. His mother carried him on her hip, and when he cried, offered a fee. Soon a newborn came along, to usurp seat and teat, and Swami skidded to the ground. He roamed the streets, a stomach on two legs, thinking food, dreaming food, stealing, loving, and hating food, which occupied every waking moment and which was never enough. Childhood flickered past. His parents, brothers, and sisters begged with an easy felicity and cleverness, <laughs> slapping their stomachs, revealing a weeping sore, or pointing into the distance where a fictional baby, parent, or sibling was dying for lack of medicines. Swami was different. He observed the hands which provided them their livelihood. Cautious, hurried hands which tossed the coins and withdrew. Dainty, jeweled hands, so fragrant he wanted to lick every soft fingertip and suck the marrow from its bones. Kind, unloving women who asked, why don't you work or why don't you go to school, but never stopped long enough to find out. Swami was wounded by his many desires, which were separately a tightness in the chest, a gnawing in the stomach, a rage in the loins, and between his eyes a hard resolve a resolve as solid as it was clear, as ruthless as it was chaste, 
as sure as it was true, a belief that this was not how he would live his life. One febrile afternoon, when time trembled at two o'clock, Swami sat on the pavement near his home, doing nothing. A hulk of a man with a furious orange beard and a younger helper stood six feet away from a pushcart piled high with the newly skinned carcasses of goats, sheep and cattle. Dead animals with their legs bunched up, their bellies hideously pink, their eyes soft and spectacular, and in the stretched out grins, the last moments of terror. The young man heaved a carcass onto his back and disappeared down an alley between two shops. The bearded man had quick eyes that moved like fish trapped in a pool. Want to earn some money? he asked. Swami got up eagerly. The man pointed to one of his smaller animals. Take that one and follow Basha to the shop. My wife is there to take charge. 25 paise a trip. Unmindful of the stink and slime of raw flesh that stained his only shirt, Swami made five trips. When the man counted out the coins, he was elated at the prospect of money paid for doing a job and not merely given. I'll do it for you every day, he said. The man studied him closely. The boy was skinny, impoverished, no more than 10 or 11. Your parents? Swami pointed in the direction of the swamp. No problem. Then you'll work for Gaffer. The man said, introducing himself, wait near the meat market at 12 o'clock on Pir Kadin, Jumeirah and Edward. This is the evening supply and must go from abattoir to shop within the hour, which means you'll move swifter than the swiftest of these beasts once did. Swami was a dogged worker. Of the many lessons he was to learn in life, the spelling of carcasses was the biggest. Each time he lifted a goat, cow or sheep and staggered across the road and down the alley, he felt acutely the irony of it. The hooves of the dead animal scratched his calves. The soft belly clung to his hips and the sex organs of the poor beast tickled his backside. Life for life. An animal must die so man can live. Swami was contrite. He said so, addressing the beast on his back. Sorry. Sorry. After a year of ferrying carcasses, Gaffer took the boy on as a permanent help. Swami learned to cut meat as thin as paper or as thick as his wrist, in inside squares or in long strips for roasting. He learned to mince, sliver and chop to preserve the liver, kidneys, pancreas and testes without bruising them. He learned to scoop the brain out of the skull in one quivering hole and place it on the counter to tempt customers. For connoisseurs <clears throat> who wanted an entire flank, he cut delicately through layers that held the ball and socket of the hip, dislocated the bones and, unhinging the knee, wrapped the ripe pink meat in a diaphanous sheet of fat before offering it to the buyer. Dadiwala Gaffer, with eyes which moved like fish in a pool, was known for selling the best quality meat to believers and non-believers. For the former, he killed the goat himself aligning the animal towards Mecca, holding its feet in one sure grip with his left arm wrapped around the head and with the right neatly slitting the throat across the front while calling out Allah to show mercy on the sacrificer and the sacrificed. Swami watched and admired the skill of slaying with grace. <coughs> Swami sat behind the meat counter that was as long as a six-seater while Gaffer sat at the other end well away from the meat-cutting swami. Gaffer could sit in absolute stillness, staring into the harsh sunlight outside and yet being mindful of everything that went on in his shop. Whatever form of salutation he used for his customers, Namaste, Salam Alaikum, Good Morning or Ram Ram, and whatever the weight and quality of meat bought, a quarter kilo of the cheapest cattle meat or 12 kilos of tender lamb, he treated customers with courtesy and fairness. Swami did not know it then, but everything he did and became in life was in an effort to emulate Dadiwala Gaffer. Swami's only shirt was spattered with blood, slime and grizzle, and the boy sported it with professional pride. His family did not mind, absolutely not, as long as he got paid. 
On Fridays, he brought home legs, ribs, tongue, eyes, and fat. Soft white glistening adipose sheets and ribbons wrapped in newspaper. Swami's mother disliked Muslims but had no problem accepting the meat they gave away. The stomach is no religion. She chucked everything her son brought into the cooking pot with some salt and two red chilies. They ate it hot and crackling with copious amounts of watery rice. The fat and the meat put some roundness into his sister's cheeks and Swami was content. In trying to prove his gratitude to his benefactor, Swami nearly lost his job. When he weighed a purchase, it was not difficult to squint at the scales and take out a chunk before wrapping it in paper. An ounce here, an ounce there, and by, by the end of the day, he would have saved Gaffer a few, good few kilos of meat. If anyone questioned, he tilted his wrist a few degrees to simulate fairness on the scale and looked defiantly at the buyer. He had practiced, practiced it for a few days and was weighing two pounds of beef for a regular. He stared intently at the scales, let his wrist do the tilting, and took away a nice big chunk. As he reached for the paper to wrap it in, Gaffer said, without looking, put it back. <laughs> when the customer left, Gaffer got up and came round to face Swami across the meat counter. The beard pointed weapon-like. The fish jerked in their pools. Where did you learn to do that? Swami moved back, afraid that Gaffer would hit him. It's like this, said Gaffer, lightly touching the scales. There's good and there's bad. Everywhere for you to see. You will never wipe out one or the other. But if you can increase the good rather than decrease it, your life is worth something. If you go the other way, you are worth less than the last bit of dung which fell off that beast. This mighty lesson from the unlettered Gaffer rescued Swami several times in his life. A uh, little later on, I'm just <coughs> reading this portion. Uh, Swami is in love with the oldest daughter of Gaffer. And they're both children, of course, but she's, she's older to him. <coughs> it was the afternoon of one Jumeirah Swami had returned from school, changed into his work clothes, and settled behind the counter. He cut meat, weighed, wrapped it in paper, and handed it to waiting customers. He had served the first four when Gaffer says, Keep aside six kilos of choice halal mutton for the nikah ceremony tomorrow. And you can take the day off. I'm closing the shop for the day. Nikah, the meat knife, landed on Swami's stove. Gaffer applied a generous pinch of coffee powder, tied it with a cloth, and told the boy to be careful. Swami lay awake that night, angry that no one, not even Gaffer, had thought of him before promising Sabiha to someone else. He was younger than her, but did that matter? Gaffer had told him once that the Prophet's wife, Khatija, had been years older than him. Then? Then? Swami had always considered Muslims different from him in unimportant things like clothes, food, festivals. Now he hated them, from the personal to the general. After a discussion with boys in school, he realized that Muslims hated everyone. They were violent and immoral, thieves, murderers. That day, adjusting the weight scales, he said to Gaffer, You pray to Allah. Yes, said the orange beard. <coughs> <clears throat> he's not my God. I pray to Ganesha, Saraswati, Kali. Yes, the beard asserted. Our gods are better, said the boy. Gaffer put down his book of accounts. The beard stood still, the fish motionless. Swami said, you smell of atar. You don't eat betel nut. I don't like Muslims. Just because our God is different, Gaffer looked into the hot white day outside, crunching his eyes against the sun. Your God, my God, their God, God stay in heaven, don't they? Maybe they eat and talk and laugh together. Maybe they don't. Maybe. But if they can stay in the same heaven, all of them, and not have problems, they can stay here and be happy. Gaffer picked up his book and lowered his spectacles over his eyes. <coughs> Belkis, his wife, thrust her head between the curtains. What is he saying, this God, that God? 
The beard motioned her to go in. Let, later, she said, we hate this boy so much, treat him like a son. We give him meat, clothes, books, see what we get. He's still a child. He'll outgrow his silly anger and do something better than sell meat. Bilkis could not think of anything better than a butcher's job. Don't you go pampering his ego, she warned. The studying and clutching onto books as though they are sacred. That night, Garfield double-checked the boys. He knew that the words the boys spoke were not his own, but told to him by others who had heard them from others who had heard them from others. Where did such words come from? said that this time was awkward, but your speech was crushed. <laughs> Soldier. No, no, no. She is there to circulate. Why this title? <coughs> Pardon? Why this title? Title of the book. Um, it's okay. See, we're all... Um, I think the title itself provokes a lot of uh, questions and uh, the book itself provokes questions from a lot of people who hadn't read the book because one because of the title and two because of the cover. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, he looked at the cover and he said uh, all this red and this boy climbing a wall, you know, the other side, he said this is a communist. <laughs> so, a lot of, you know, uh, the story, I, th I think when I chose the title, I thought the reader might come to his or her own conclusions by the end of it, you know, when you come to the end of the story. But there are certain topics when we write about, people don't want you to write about. You know, they're not comfortable with certain topics. Um, and at the same time, these are stories that have to be told. So, it's a, that's probably the way. Um, just as uh, books, uh, touch the readers and uh, changes their lives and perception of the world. Uh, does writing a book change the you know, life and perspective, perspective of the uh, writer? Uh, are you any different uh, after writing the book? I'm sure it does change. At least personally, I do. Because I, I do get involved with my characters. I do you know, feel strongly about what I write about. So writing for me is a very uh, very much an emotional exercise. So, personally speaking, I do think it changes you. Um, can I? Hello. Um, when you develop these characters, uh, how do you how do you speak on behalf of that character? Uh, for instance, now you are talking about Gaffer. In the other book, you are talking like Velu. Then you are talking about <coughs> Mr. Yesu Kumar. So how do you really? develop these characters because uh, because you are different yourself so how do you how do you imagine what he would have said and how he would have felt i think this is this is a question to all the authors not only to you but what is the technique about it that's the only thing to learn if you want to write fiction is how to get into the minds of other people is the only thing if you, if you can work i mean if you can do it uh, then you can write a story and if you can't you have to do it at least for me, characters mean a lot to me. The characters, I, I, I always start a novel with characters, not with a theme. And uh, so as the characters grow, the story grows. So, yeah, you have to get into their mind. Yes. You know, I've always wondered about the curious relationship between the medical profession and the literary profession. and. You know, there are doctors that I know who, with their, uh, you know, place in the arena of human life, seem to have these great insights into human beings and, you know, human activities and things like that. And they have these wonderful stories. And I know of, you know, I can think of quite a few doctors who have turned this into literature. 
you know, whether it's A.J. Cronin or whether it's Abraham Varghese or whoever. Would you like to comment on this? It is true, doctors are fortunate that um, we have um, a look into the inner world of many people. And um, patients, when they come in through the door, they, 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 they get your confidence and they, they will reveal their pain and suffering. And I think most of all we learn from patients, actually. We learn a lot from patients. There's so much dignity in the suffering involved in any sort of especially serious forms of disease or the family you know, tensions that <coughs> surround any one person falling ill. You know, this is all played out every day in various lives, but then the doctor gets a concentrated view of, from different, at different levels and of different people. And I think that certainly changes us and uh, develops a certain uh, sort of perspective towards uh, the way we can withstand suffering. I mean, sometimes I wonder how the limits of suffering, how much pain can a person bear? How much? And you, you, you're always surprised by how much uh, a human being can can bear, and with dignity. This is something we learn all the time. Yes. Yes. Madam, a very nice paragraph from the book you just read. Why the name Swami for the boy who is working in a butcher shop? <laughs> His parents gave him the name, so... For the book you, you are the <laughs> I put the blame on the parents. <laughs> Whenever I don't know how to answer a question, I put it on the character. Yeah, yeah. Put the, put the, put the switch on. Hello. Yeah, are your books very popular in the medical fraternity? They are both popular and unpopular. Uh, in the sense, when I talk about, uh, well, I don't know how this will be received, but I do have a sort of a medical character who's a quack. In this, there's a quack, but he's such a lovable quack. You know, he's such a good doctor, although he's a quack. So maybe some doctors won't like that. Or when I talk of, um, in a previous novel, I've talked about failure. You know, doctors failing in what they do. And that did not please some people. But generally, I find doctors do um, empathize and they do like it, or especially medical students, and they always write to you and you know, young doctors. Yes. So you get both points. Of view. I have a question. In the books you have written, are there any characters whom you did not like? <laughs> Maybe a few uh, characters, if I say, I do not like, well, I don't know. But there are some, sometimes you want to do a, a very hasty sketch of a character. The character is not very important to the story. You might have something. And then you might do it very, you know, very quickly or not with that much care and maybe you don't develop so much affection for the character in the end. But really, I think that's very rare. Most of the time, all characters belong to your, uh, I mean, when you when you work on their inner minds and everything, you, you like them. Yeah. At least for me, I mean, I do think I feel, I have not, never felt um, totally against a character. Yeah, I'm going again. You said that you begin your books with your characters. Yeah. Does that mean that a novel for you is an exploration and you don't know you're discovering as the thing goes? Yeah, the first part. The, when I first planned the novel, yeah, for about one year I work, I just carry the characters in my head. Okay. I find that much easier to do than to have some sort of a plot and then to try and fit in characters. It doesn't work for me. I, I can never do that. But when I, um, when I live with the characters, so to speak, and I might scribble a few lines here and there and keep notes, but I don't read them even, but it helps me to develop the characters. And as the characters develop, the situations develop automatically, you know. So uh, the story just moves. And uh, after I've written the first draft, a very rough first draft, then when I read it, I understand what I want to see or, or, or what I, what is going to, what, I, what might happen. And then the whole plot and the ending and everything comes subsequently. But the first draft is very important because that is where the real uh, 
know, whatever, whatever you want to say in the book, that you, you, you come to understand that. So, are you saying that the first draft is written by the characters and the second gut draft level, is written by you? Mm, no, I mean that the first draft is a very gut level thing. It's very rough, it is shabby, you know, it may not make much sense even to some people, but it makes, it, 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 it really, it's like the dreams, you know, we have, which are a little bit confused, yeah. but when they combine observation, they, they begin to, you know, have a certain pattern. So. You were talking of, uh, <coughs> literature impacting society. <coughs> How do you react to Anandati Roy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, there are two things about Anandati Roy. Um, one is the, uh, the fiction writing Anandati Roy and the other is the non-fiction writing Anandati Roy, who is uh, also an activist. That's also probably fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. No, um, I think, I mean, personally, my feeling is she does influence a lot of people. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I think she's, she's got a lot of genuine concerns, but my problem is that she only sees one side of the picture. I think you need to see both sides, and I think you need to have a balance. I mean, you need to listen to both sides. You, the minute you decide very much earlier that you belong to one side and you constantly, for instance, saying that technology is criminal or technology is wrong and uh, then you begin to take a position where uh, you are defeating yourself because if I say technology is wrong, I mean I can't sit here and you know use this or use my computer. I mean Arundhati Rai uses a computer. She uses technology all the time. So you can't, it's, it's, it's very, it's okay at a certain level to reveal certain things. But I personally feel that a balance to be used better. But about influencing society, certainly. Her writings do influence. We've listened to many writers talk about their work. I mean, it's a comment, really. Uh, did you feel as a doctor you needed to justify being a writer? And uh, from what I understand, you've put a lot of thought into how you write and why you write. I'm a doctor myself. So a lot of analysis into how you write and why you write. Do you think being a scientist or a doctor has helped you understand yourself as a writer? Because most writers we talk to just talk about their writing as a creative process and not how they write. I think it's it comes afterwards, the reflection. The reflecting about all this comes afterwards. You first do things. Uh, and it's better not to be self-conscious when you do something. Later, you can always reflect on it, wonder whether it was the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do. But I think generally, whether it's writing, especially in writing, it's better not to get too self-conscious and stay true to your own uh, voice, you know, the voice you're going to uh, develop for a certain book. Like every book has a tone of voice. And once you have found that out, like I said in the first draft, you really recognize your tone of voice for that particular book. and then. It's okay. And later you can look back and, like in a book like this one, when I write it, I don't know which characters from real life I might be using. You know, in the book, I don't consciously use characters, but I, except in one book where I have consciously used, but all my others I don't. But I, when I read back, I can see similarities. So there's sort of a fusion of uh, your imagination and observation. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, uh, which is more satisfying, being a surgeon or being a writer? Both. <laughs> Both. I just can't choose between the two, honestly. But you've stopped being a surgeon. Have yeah, you? off late. I still do. Like this year, I went away and did two months of surgery in Tamil Nadu where it was needed for some place. So I went and did that. What so kind I of a surgeon up. are you? What kind I'm of a general surgeon. You are a general, general surgeon. Which means in a rural area, you do everything. <laughs> what do you do now? I run a clinic, um, which is very simple GP clinic, um, where I see patients, and most of them are um, construction workers in a place where there are a lot of construction workers. So that's that's the medical work I'm doing when I'm in my home listing. But I might go away and do surgery for a while, for a few months or something. Now I I've decided to have an option because uh, I feel it gives me more time, one to do other things that I like doing to write because being a surgeon all your life it is a it is teamwork it is wonderful it's great it is uh, it is also in some ways um, 
shackles you to a certain path, you know, narrow path. So I wanted to be free of that. I miss surgery and that's why I go and you know, do some, but uh, generally I think... You said you live in Lonavala, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have an observation to make. Uh, when I was hearing your prose, basically it felt like you were very clinical and surgical about the butcher shop. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I can't avoid this. <laughs> These are the awkwardness of my style, I suppose. <laughs> so, you have any influencing authors? Obviously, because exactly, but, as uh, doctors we imagine, uh, you know, all, everything, uh, it was because we've like seen a it. It social yeah? statement mixed with a clinical yes. text. So, I mean, that's my observation. Yeah, you're, you're right. Your, I mean, your observation is very right. But who has influenced you? Who meaning? Uh, Any writer? Lots of writers. I think. Any role model? No, I don't. Ha I don't have role models, but I, I deeply admire certain writers. And, uh, so. Can name I, admi you? I admire Kipling, Robert Graves. Shivrama Karan, Girish Karnad, I admire as a drop of yeah, Thoru, Thoru is a favorite writer of mine. I am very fond of Gandhi's, my experiments with food. I have a lot of favorite books <laughs> and writers. There are many. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my question is to you. How do you take time when you have been treating your patients and uh, in writing the books, yeah. treating the patients simultaneously, how you took the time? Um, I don't do them simultaneously, but I write, I write in the mornings, early mornings, and then before going to work. Thank you. Manik. Manik. And I write on Sundays more. Would you like to publish the thought process itself? You said you got a draft. Sorry, sir. Would you like to publish the thought process? Because a lot of us are very curious about how a book is written, how an author thinks the process through. Uh, it, in the film world, it started becoming fashionable. You get uh, larger versions where the unedited scripts come, pictures come through, the scenes that didn't make it to the movie come through, which sort of gives us an idea into the process by which the movie was made. Would you like to, let's say, publish it along with your uh, rough cut drafts? Would you reveal your thinking in the making of the book? I don't mind revealing, but nobody can be interested. <laughs> I mean, they may be interested in a you know, Nobel laureate or a Booker Prize winner or somebody whose first draft interests some you know, people, but otherwise, yeah. it, may not, it may not appeal to many people. But some I have no problem. I have no problem in showing it to anybody. Did you publish your book? I've never found out. As from I said, the point of view of trying to understand all the authors, yeah. Like, but I, but, yeah, but as I said, I'm not trying to be modest. But as I said, they probably would like a, a, a really well well known writer, no? Maybe a Nobel Prize winner you know, or somebody. He shows his first draft. Then they may be interested. Sorry, may I <laughs> respond to that? There's this magazine called the Paris Reviews, which yeah. are available on the net, which have lengthy interviews with various famous authors about how they wrote their books. It, it actually, Paris Review is wonderful. In fact, even the um, books, the actual books, if you can get hold of them, they're wonderful things. Yeah. Can we read? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. How has your own relationship to what you read changed now that you are a writer? My relationship with read books. What you read? I'm more choosy maybe, but actually I like reading all types of books. I don't have... Um, I, I read all types of books. Uh, I, I, yeah, I get more choosy because I read um, slower now. I don't want to read very fast. I'm not particularly interested in, uh, you know, time pass sort of book. But I like thrillers. I like, I really love them. I read a wide variety. Yeah. Kaveri, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I just have a couple of questions. One is, uh, who do you write for uh, as, a, as a writer? Do you have an audience in your mind when you write? The other thing is that you've been talking a lot about the surgeons and doctors understanding and things like that. 
isn't there a certain romanticization of the doctor? Because if you're looking at the five-star cultures that, uh, of doctors that you're seeing around, uh, how many of them really either have the time to understand um, the patient or the inclination to understand the patient? Definitely not as much time as chartered accountants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you've touched a right now there because that is true. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of things that are wrong with our health system is, uh, you know, we, we are to blame. And we have to accept the blame. It's about time we accepted the blame that we, we have. We have screwed it up in India. We have screwed it up. Yeah. The audience I write for, I'm not, I don't think that way when I write. I'm not, I don't consider audience at that time. I just write because I feel, if I think of audience, I'll be self-conscious. I might tailor my writing to suit a particular audience. So I don't do that. And uh, being an Indian writer and uh, knowing several Indian languages and setting my characters in different places in India, I tend to... Um, use my dialogue also, um, I, I do dialogue in, um, in, my, in the local language, like maybe Tamil, maybe Hindi, whichever I'm using, you know, for the dialogue. And then I translate it into English in my mind. I mean, it gets translated, but it works. I'm sure all, most of us are, you know, familiar with this type of uh, thinking process where we think several languages, really, and uh, probably that helps us. And that is, one way of reaching our audience, but I don't uh, particularly tailor it or I don't think of audience at that time. When you write, do you want to make a statement? Not until the end, I, then I might look at it. That is when I say end, maybe much, much later. I might look at it and see where well, is this. So you just want to tell a story? Yes, I want to tell a story. And if there is a theme to it, then I will use it. If I find a theme, like this book, more or less has a sort of a theme to it, hasn't it? So uh, then I m might make sure that that is clear, up to a point, where as much as fiction allows, but I don't try to wrap it up in any particular way, more than you know what is allowed. Yeah. What about movies? Uh, one minute. I'm going to. Can this book be made into a movie, like Plumdog Millionaire or something? <laughs> no, I have no idea. No, why I'm saying that is probably it will reach a larger audience. Are you of in for a uh, thing where it reaches a I larger... I mean, who wouldn't like <laughs> if it was accepted for no, a No, there's nothing from said. your side that you wouldn't like to like it to be made into a movie. No, I have no such... Uh, I'm very fond of films, mm. so there is no question of not <laughs> Yeah, my question is... Poor and poverty is always part of yeah, yes, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Poor and poverty is always part of the novels. Like off late people have started, all the writers have started writing about poor and poverty. <laughs> Maybe to influence the West or get some <coughs> Booker prizes or you know I don't know what prizes you have around. So is that you know fashion now that you know write about poor poverty in the country, talk about you know awkwardness of the country which exists or you know um, honest, honest answer. Yeah, yeah. Because this question, <laughs> this I, will, I have already been uh, sort of uh, criticized for in, in a certain way. When this book was shortlisted for the Manishian uh, Literary Prize, it was the same time Madiga's book was announced to have won the book. So this whole poverty thing came out and I thought, oh my dear, my God, this is, you know, I have very similar stuff. The book is very different entirely different to Adiga's book, but I, I thought people would probably think that. But anyway, um, we, were, we, were take, we were invited to Hong Kong for the ceremony, five writers, and we had a radio interview and readings and so on. And another Indian writer did say this. He said it's very fashionable now to write about poverty and um, rural areas and so on in India, but I don't do it, he said. So he made it sound very indecent, you know, you write about poverty, you're doing something wrong. I personally feel, I don't, first of all, I don't think every book is being written on poverty, no, not at all. And uh, secondly, I think you must write about what you want to write. You should, cannot, cannot say that, oh, this is, 
not for me. Maybe you say it's, it's a coincidence, to... right? You know, everything is... It's a coincidence. I mean, it, it so happens that I happened to write this book and Adiga happened to write right. that book. And Slumdog Millionaire happened. Yes. I haven't even seen that movie as yet. But, I mean, these things happen. But I don't think it's fashionable. Or if people do it for fashion, um, I would regret that. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank, thank, you thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And you've already explained how you develop the characters and how this happens. But what I'm curious about, what makes you or what inspires you to take a new character? Is it a scene on the road? Is it something from your working life? Or what could be uh, an incident which allows you to say, oh, I'll choose this character and go for a new book? It's very really elusive. It is, uh, I don't think I could. I could really give a concrete example about any single character. Um, the only thing I, can, I know very with great clarity is in my previous novel, The Hills of Angeli, where the protagonist is loosely semi-autobiographical. So I know it, you know. Uh, but otherwise, um, it's very elusive. Uh, you you might get an image of somebody. Maybe physical somebody, maybe character, maybe some. There, there's some sort of a mingling that goes on uh, in the mind, and then you, the character comes out. It is part imagination, part observation. So it's a, it's it's not possible to define it. Not for me. What is it like when there are two writers living under the same roof? What are the plus points and what are the negatives? It's like two chartered accountants. No, 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 no. Why should it be different? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the scent of pepper and I wrote it quite effortlessly. How long so do you take write to write a book? <coughs> scent of pepper took only one year, but then I kept it for a long time before I published it, I think, you know, a couple of years. It takes anything from a year to, like this book took much longer. It took me at least three years to write, but five years to have it published. So it varies. But I would say three years minimum nowadays, and probably I tend to take longer now. Which Can again is difficult to explain. Simultaneously write two, three books at a time? No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Like two, three books. No? no, I can't do that. No short stories? <laughs> I've written a few, but not much. I think I prefer to stay with one, uh, one medium most of the time. I do write non-fiction, as I said, but I'm, I find non-fiction more difficult to write. Poetry? No, I don't write. Maybe there is one person in the house to write. And he's very good. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever changed the story that you came in the last story? Sorry, well, have I changed it? Have you ever changed the story when you came in the last and you were heading the story and you felt that no, it's not the way I should write it? Did you go back and change it? Sometimes, like you change the pattern, even the ending may change. Yeah, I have changed. Sure. Like surely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because by then you're thinking of by then you're thinking of the audience and the readers and everything. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Kaveri. Wonderful. You always thought that it is very difficult to understand a writer, but you made it possible. <laughs> Thank you once again. As a token of affection, may I request Dr. Devita, our own expert surgeon, yes. but she's not yet written. <laughs> may I request her to. Devita, please come. Two things. <laughs> Two, twenty things you said. Yeah. Um, Am I allowed to share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, Kaveri was about four years senior to me in medical college, and uh, I was sixteen and a half when I joined college. And uh, we looked up to her. And the first week, the freshers were uh, ragged, and the kind of ragging we're talking about is very simple, mild ragging. And I was chosen to clean her room. We all had individual rooms. <laughs> and amazing sense of humor. I'm going back to 69, 41 years ago. She said, Evita, now while you're sweeping my room, I'd like you to sing. And at the time, there was a very popular song, Do What You Do, Do Well, Boy. Do, it was a kind of a cowboy song. And she made me sing that while I swept the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody for this evening. We will have another month in mid-December and the announcement will come shortly. Thank you everybody for this evening. Thank you, Kaveri. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.